Boy, that's fun. I really enjoy walking around and greeting people. I know you do too. Uh, it's good to be worshiping with a group of people that actually want to be here with you. Isn't that kind of neat? Um, some of you might be wondering what we're doing this Sunday. I've called it Vision Sunday. Um, it strikes me that uh, our church has been going through a lot of changes. And I think sometimes when, when changes happen, uh, well, to use the therapist's language, it's a grieving process. But uh, change is always challenging and difficult, and uh, we are often wanting to hold on to what we uh, have become accustomed to. And uh, I, I really think that we can't do church that way. I think that we have to hang on to God and let him take us where he's going. You know, when God first approached the Israelites, he didn't say, uh, let's just enjoy life here in Egypt. He said, let's go somewhere. And he radically changed everything about their lives. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that the true model of what it means to follow Christ is that we are on a journey with him. And I think as a church, that's a reality as well. And I think it's good for us to remember that. So I wanted to share with you as pastor some of the things that I feel are vitally important in terms of what God is up to, what he's doing among us, what he's calling us to do, and what it means to be in Christ. Uh, what, what it is that we're doing here together. So I wanted to share with you along those lines. Um, let me start off by talking about myself. I am the senior pastor of this church. I have been serving the church as senior pastor for a little over 11 years now. March 1st was 11 years. Um, when I was at my previous church, there were things God was pointing out to me as I studied the scriptures and taught and preached that were weighing more and more heavily on my heart and mind. I was pastoring a Hispanic church in Fort Worth, and even though we did everything bilingually, it was clear to me that we were only targeting a particular demographic. The thought of us reaching outside the Hispanic community was not even entertained. But I was feeling more and more convicted that the church cannot be built around our own comfort, our own preferences, our own circle of friends. The command we've been given is to go to the ends of the earth. Jesus desires that every tribe, nation, people, and language come together to worship him. I sensed that God was telling me that my time at the church I was pastoring was coming to an end. I had shared with this church what I could, and I had a sense of closure that I had given what God wanted me to give, and it was okay to move on. It was at this time that someone, and I honestly can't remember who, sent me the job description that the pastoral search team of Prairie Creek had put together. I looked it over, and it it resonated with exactly what I felt God was laying on my heart. They had spent, this pastoral search team had spent time in prayer, and as a church, Prairie Creek had spent time in prayer and considered alternatives, and as a church, they had concluded that God was calling them to be a neighborhood church that reached out to everyone, regardless of ethnic or cultural background. They were looking for a pastor that could lead them in this new direction. Plano had become much more diverse than it once was, and Prairie Creek wanted to reach whomever God was bringing into their neighborhood. And that was exactly what I was feeling church should be. So I sent in my resume. This was the only resume that I ever sent out. I wasn't actively seeking a church. I put it in God's hands, and my attitude was, if this is where you want me, you're going to make it clear. I didn't know until afterward that my resume was one of over 200 that the pastoral search team was evaluating. Every step of the way, it just clicked. It just seemed like we were meant for each other. This was where God wanted me. When I arrived, we made changes immediately. <clears throat> we focused on two key things that God had laid on my heart that I believe are crucial to church life. One of these things was home groups. 
The early church did life together in homes as well as in large gatherings. And I believe firmly that we need those kinds of spaces in church life where intimacy can develop. So we started something that had never been done at Prairie Creek. Weekly, ongoing home groups that would continue as a regular part of church life. We've been doing this for 11 years now. The other thing we did was to place reaching our diverse neighborhood front and center. For some years before I arrived, one of the church ministries had been teaching English as a second language classes. These were held on Monday night, and there was a small group of people in the church involved in the ministry. In fact, a lot of the ministry was done by people from other churches who would come in and help because there wasn't that large a group of people interested in our church in doing that ministry. But when I found out about this, I said, well, that's a real need that will allow us to reach a diverse neighborhood. Why don't we think of our Wednesday nights a little differently? Why don't we think of Wednesday night not as miniature Sunday morning, but as a something completely different. Let's think of Wednesday night as the night in which we're going to try to connect with our neighborhood and serve them. So we moved our ESL to Wednesday night, and it became kind of the centerpiece of what we were trying to do on Wednesdays. And uh, Wednesday became Connections Night, and we started trying to reach out and connect with our diverse community. And ESL gave us a wonderful way to do that because people from every a nation and language was, were coming to our church to these classes. Uh, Wednesdays at Prairie Creek, since I arrived, have been mainly focused on reaching out to the community. And it's through these efforts that God has transformed the congregation in the past 11 years. I will say as pastor, I have never switched focus. There have been significant changes in our church structure and life over the past three or four years, but all of these have occurred in pursuit of the same goal of reaching our neighborhood in all of its diversity. During COVID, I felt strongly that I should protect the health of our members, and I am happy that we've reached a point where vaccinations make the virus much, much less threatening than it once was. I remember the first year of COVID when so many people were dying and the numbers kept rising and rising. We did not suffer the losses of life that some other congregations did, especially in that first year of COVID. And right as COVID was hitting, Charles McLeod retired. He had served as our uh, pastor of music and youth and anything. I mean, through the years, he had served for decades. Longer than any pastor has served here, Charles has served. And uh, his retirement meant a, a real uh, moment of change for us as a congregation. The time for changes had arrived, and it was happening right in the middle of COVID. But we had to face them head on. One thing that I I'm, uh, had some frustration about in my 11 years here, I believe consistently over these 11 years, we've been losing younger people in this church. I would, people about my age would show up and love it. People younger than me would not. And the, the ones we had, we've, we've, man, we've uh, lost through the years. So uh, one thing... Uh, that I felt strongly at this moment that we needed to focus on is not ourselves. Not on what is most comfortable to us, but on making every adjustment possible to remove any barriers to people coming to Christ and joining our church life here. We have been called to reach a multi-ethnic, multi-generational community. And we want leadership that reflects that and that will be inviting not just to us, but to those we are trying to reach. The style of our music needed to appeal to younger persons, and it's the task of those of us who are more mature in our walk in Christ to make the adjustment for their benefit rather than center everything we're doing around ourselves and our own comfort. God has brought Aaron to us to help lead in this way. And look at our stage now. We have three generations of musicians represented and multiple ethnicities. This same worship team is doing worship in Spanish. 
This is what a team leading worship in a church should look like. One thing that changed over COVID was that I began to record my sermons in both Spanish and English. When we started meeting in person again, our Spanish-speaking members pleaded with me to continue to share God's Word with them in their heart language. They had found it to be very meaningful over the past year, so with some hesitation, I agreed to continue to do so. I did not want this to divide our church. What began to happen right away, though, convinced me that God was behind this. Now that we were preaching in Spanish, our members were able to invite all their friends and acquaintances, whether they knew English or not. All the people they knew that they'd been running into, people who had only recently arrived here and have not yet had the opportunity to learn English. Unbelievers started showing up, people who'd never heard the gospel. And they didn't just show up, they kept coming. I have already baptized a few. God has allowed us to reach people we would have never reached otherwise. And I realized, I can't tell these people to go away, come back when you've learned English and I'll share Jesus with you. I'll share it now. But how do we address the divides? One thing we've tried to do this year is make our fifth Sunday services much more intentional about uh, not just worship, but also making it an international festival of worship and food. So we not only worship together in multiple languages, but we sit together afterwards and break bread together. We moved in our Sunday services, we moved the start time of our Sunday English service back 15 minutes recently so that we would have a little bit more time between the end of the Spanish language service and the beginning of the English service so that as people are, are exiting here from the Spanish service and as people are coming down from Sunday school to enter into the English service we have a solid 15 minutes where we can mingle out there drink coffee and have donuts And all our services, we're constantly encouraging people to reach out to our members who have a different heart language. We're encouraging our members in every part of our congregation to do the kingdom work of building community with them. Many of you have stepped up admirably. We need to continue to do more, to talk to one another, to step out of our own comfort zone and embrace others and get to know them. Don't worry if they speak English or not. Practice your broken Spanish on them. Give them a chance to practice their broken English on you. Learn to kiss. Teach them to hug. Let's do this together. What should our vision be? What should we be focused on as a church? What does God want of us? I think we should begin with what's most important to God, His big picture. In Ephesians 1 7 through 10, Paul tells us God's grand purpose, what he is accomplishing in Jesus Christ. Let me read this for you. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God wanted to redeem us, to rescue us from sin and death, to forgive our many trespasses, but it is more than just forgiving us and restoring us individually that he is after. The great mystery of his will is finally made clear with the arrival of Jesus Christ. Once the plan was fully implemented and unveiled in him, we can see what God was after all along. To unite all things in him. This means that what God wants to see happen in our church is not only that we should be forgiven our sins and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, but that we should then turn around and join him in the unification of all things in him. God wants to bring everything together in Jesus. When it comes to the Great Commission, this means we don't pick and choose 
We don't decide who we want to focus on and who we're going to ignore. We are deliberately pursuing everyone and making all necessary adjustments on our end to reach whoever God puts in our path. If God's working to unite all things in Jesus, what is it he wants us to do? What is our task? Matthew gives us the most concise expression of this task we've been given in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Because of the victory Jesus has accomplished already in his death and resurrection, because sin and death itself are condemned to die, we who belong to the victor, Jesus Christ, are commanded to go into all the nations of the earth and make disciples who make a public commitment to him through baptism and who devote themselves to keep every single thing he has commanded us. Jesus did not tell us to go to our own ethnic group, to people of our nationality. He told us to go to everyone, everywhere. Because of this, Christians have always been a missionary people. Because of this, we at Prairie Creek continue to contribute to the BGCT and the SBC because both of these organizations primarily invest themselves in sending missionaries out to do the work of the kingdom. But we're living in an era never seen before in human history. The level of mobility we have available to us today has made the entire world one neighborhood. Today, people travel from the furthest reaches of the globe in a matter of hours or a day or two at the absolute most. Journeys that used to take years can be done in two days. Some of us go overseas to share Jesus with the nations in their homeland. But who is going to reach all the immigrants who have left their homeland to come here? God has placed the nations of the earth in our own neighborhood. And we carry out the Great Commission right here in Plano as we reach all the nations around us because if we don't do it, nobody does it. Nobody is sending missionaries in their languages to come here and minister to them here. It's our task. We do this by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. What exactly is the gospel all about? What's the core nature of the gospel message? I think Paul probably dug deeper into what the gospel is all about than any other Christian I know of. He had something profound to say about it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The gospel is, at its heart, a ministry of reconciliation. Sin is war. Sin is what has broken our fellowship with God and our fellowship with each other. And the gospel is how God is restoring what sin broke. We call all people to stop fighting against God. To come to Him in loving adoration, in faith, in surrender. To receive from Him life abundant and eternal. But we are also calling the entire human family back to communion. Back to the table. 
The gospel is the message with the power to bring about reconciliation throughout the whole human race if we will surrender to it. When we invite people to the feet of Jesus, we are also inviting them to embrace this ministry of reconciliation. What better way to do this than to provide an immediate context within which to begin this reconciliation? A church with people from many nations who share life together, who honor languages and cultures and the full spectrum of human experience, but still pursue unity of heart and purpose. In building a deliberately multi-ethnic, multilingual church, we are showing the world what the gospel is all about. Just what it is that Jesus is going to do with our lives if we surrender to him in faith, if we become his disciples. There are challenges to unity. It is hard to share life when we have core beliefs and practices that are different. Consider for a moment how hard it was for the first Christians to share life together. You think you've got it rough. Consider what it was like for a Jew. Jews had been taught their entire lives that God's law demanded that they abstain from eating certain foods. Because to do so would make them unclean and unfit to draw near to God. To even come into contact with a person who ate this food would make one unclean. That's why they wouldn't go into the house of a Gentile. Then God poured out his Holy Spirit on non-Jews who were, according to the law of Moses, unclean, unfit to draw near to God. And yet God drew near to them anyway, making it clear that dietary restrictions and circumcision were no longer in effect that they were to be understood as illustrations of holiness, not the substance itself of holiness. But Jewish Christians still kept kosher. They still circumcised their sons. It allowed them to continue reaching out to their unbelieving Jewish friends and neighbors, to go uh, uh, share Jesus with them in the synagogue and until it was destroyed in A.D. 70 in the temple courts. But now Gentiles were in the church, and they ate pork and had a lifestyle drastically different from theirs. They did not circumcise their sons. The temptation was to abandon this call to unity, to reconciliation. They could have just had Jewish Christian churches and Gentile Christian churches. Let me ask you this. Find me one verse in the New Testament that talks about segregated churches. One verse, one mention of even the idea of it. There's no such thing. This thought is not even suggested in the New Testament. As God inspired the biblical authors to write for us the books of the New Testament, he made sure there wasn't even a whiff of segregation mentioned as a possibility in the life of the church. I think this point stands out powerfully in Paul's letters. Consider his example. We're told in the book of Acts that Paul embarked on three missionary journeys. On the first, he established congregations in the region of Galatia and Eastern Asia, Southeastern Asia Minor. When he finished this trip, there was a big debate about what to do with the Gentile Christians, whether they should be instructed to be circumcised and observe kosher diets. So Paul traveled with many others down to Jerusalem where a council was held and they determined that they would ask Gentiles to abstain from three things. Food contaminated by idol worship, sexual immorality, and consuming blood. Paul never mentioned this council in any of his letters because even though he fully agreed about sexual immorality, and it's very clear from his letters that he did, he disagreed about the other two requirements, the dietary restrictions that the council had tagged on there as kind of a way of appeasing Jewish sensibilities. 
He would argue in his letters that idolatry is demonic and evil, but the food, even if it's been offered to an idol, is just food in and of itself. It neither commends us to God nor makes us sinful before him. It's just food. No doubt there were Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who did not share Paul's point of view. On Paul's second journey, he established congregations in Macedonia up north and Greece coming down south on the uh, western side of Asia Minor. He spent 18 months in Corinth establishing a congregation in what the ancient world viewed as their sin city. It was the Las Vegas of the first century. A lot of money, a lot of uh, debauchery. Already, while on, his, on this second missionary journey, Paul receives word that Jewish persons from Jerusalem have come to the churches he had only recently started in Galatia, telling them that they have to be circumcised and keep kosher to be saved. He wrote a passionate letter to the church calling them back to the true gospel. But this presented Paul with a profound problem. He could see the rift forming between Jewish and Gentile believers. Some of, Jewish, uh, some of the Jewish Christians were trying to force everyone to become like them before they would extend fellowship to them, before they would grant them the status as people of God. Sadly, we Christians have continued to do the same to this day. Much of mission work over the past 200 years has been conducted as an export of North American and British Christianity around the world. Complete with the songs we have written, the clothing we decide is appropriate to wear in worship, and the cultural patterns of behavior, let's say Victorian English cultural patterns of behavior that we find most appealing. We've taught the world that the only way to be in Christ is our way of being in Christ. I think Paul would be very disappointed. With this brewing in Paul's heart, he embarked on his third missionary journey. This was the most successful of the three. He was finally able to get to Ephesus on the western coast of Asia Minor, and he spent over two years there. God was opening doors and holding them open for them, protecting the Christians through fierce opposition, and God was working mightily. Paul was training Christian leaders, sending them out to the surrounding cities to plant churches. It's at this time that God put on Paul's heart a, a, a thought. He knew that Jerusalem was going through hard times. There had been a drought. There was genuine lack. People there were in need and suffering. And the city itself was be becoming a powder keg as open revolt against Rome was brewing. And you know how that works. Hatred against all foreign influences, anything non-Jewish, was on the rise. Paul could see the rift getting even deeper. What can I do to heal this? And this was what came to his heart. You know, the churches uh, here in Macedonia and Greece that I've been working with, they're doing well. There's no drought here. People are doing well. In fact, in Corinth, there are some really wealthy Christians that could afford to give very generously. So he began writing letters, and he wrote two letters to Corinth while he was in Ephesus. He uh, was going to collect an offering from the Gentile churches. They were enjoying abundance, so he writes these two letters, long letters to the church in Corinth, and in both letters, he devotes enormous passages to arguing and persuading and pushing and cajoling and doing everything he can to encourage them to give extravagantly to this collection for the saints in Jerusalem. He wanted this offering to knock people's socks off. He told these Gentiles that they owed a debt of gratitude to their brothers and sisters who were Jewish. It was because of them that they had been able to receive the gospel that it changed everything for them. It's only fitting that they should give an offering in love to help them in a time of their need. Eventually, Paul's time in Ephesus was done. 
And he felt called to keep pressing on to the ends of the earth sharing the gospel. He wanted to go further west. He wanted to go through Rome and for the churches in Rome to pray for him and send him out. And from there he would go all the way to Spain. He knew his work in the eastern side was concluded. It was time to head west. So he traveled from Ephesus and went up north and then visited the churches in Macedonia and came down into Greece and arrived in Corinth. As he traveled, he was collecting this offering from all the churches. Not only that, he was getting representatives from these churches to come and join him on a long journey to Jerusalem so that people would not only see the money, but the faces of the people who had given that money to them. They were coming down to Corinth with him. From Corinth, Paul wrote to the churches in Rome because he wanted to visit them on his way further east to Spain. He introduced himself because Paul had never been to Rome at that time. And he explained the gospel he preached as well as his passion for sharing that gospel with anyone and everyone. But before he could do this, and he really wanted to, he was going to travel all the way back to Jerusalem to deliver this offering. He knew this would probably add about another year to his travel plans. He was in Greece. Greece and Italy are like this. He could have gotten to Rome very quickly from Corinth. He went all the way back to Jerusalem on the opposite end of the Mediterranean. He could have made it to Rome quickly if it had gone right then, but he cared so much about this offering and the healing he hoped it would bring to the Jewish and Gentile believers that he put it on hold so that he could deliver the offering. I want you to read his own words on this topic. In Romans 15, 22 through 29, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Paul never made it to Spain. When he arrived in Jerusalem and delivered the offering, almost immediately he was arrested and spent years in prison on trumped-up charges. Eventually, he had to appeal his case to the Caesar to avoid an assassination attempt against him. So, after spending more than two years in prison there at Caesarea Maritima, they put him on a boat and sent him off to Rome. The boat uh, had a shipwreck along the way, but eventually, Paul makes it to Rome. But when he gets there, it's as, as a prisoner in chains, awaiting his case being heard by Nero, the Caesar. But Paul models for us how we should view church. It is not a social club. It's not about making myself comfortable. It is a place where we have to be passionately committed to building the kingdom space of reconciliation and healing that the human race needs. We have to be willing to put our comfort and plans on hold for years, if need be, in pursuit of this goal. Even evangelism has to be arranged around the work of building the church right. Paul put off his evangelistic trip to Spain because the church needed to be healed of these divisions before he could move on to preach the gospel in Spain. How should we do things? How do we hear God? 
How do we move in the right direction? There are so many possibilities, so many options. I think Paul gives us great examples of how we should approach our Great Commission task. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, he lets us in on some of his tactics. <clears throat> For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not myself being, un uh, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. Paul sought to leverage everything he had to reach people with the gospel. He didn't try to make the people around him be like him. He did just the opposite. He tried to make himself like them in every way that did not in involve sin. When he devoted himself to this task, Paul realized just how very many things in his life he could adjust for the good of others without ever sinning or offending God in any way. In fact, just the opposite. He knew that God smiles on this kind of heart of service. We must also do ministry in this way. We must forego our own preferences and comforts and choose instead to focus on what is appealing and inviting to those who have not yet come to know Christ. We already have life abundant and eternal. We have the sweet presence of God's Holy Spirit within. We are already rich in Christ. From the obscene wealth we have in Christ, we can allow ourselves, we can afford to give up lesser comforts for the good of others who are lost. I'm asking those who are helping plan events in, life, in the life of the church to think this way. How can we invite people who don't know Jesus and have them actually show up, not just reshuffle all of our neighboring Christians who are going from event to event? How can we connect with the lost, with the Satanist, with the person who's involved in gangs, with the person who is so lost he has no idea there's light and life anywhere? What do we have to offer that would give us an open door to encounter these people and bring them to Jesus? And we're trying to think not what it is that we like the most, but we're trying to think what would uh, a person who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't go to church, what would he find appealing enough to show up so that we can tell him? Think about it. What can you leverage for the gospel? Let me use myself as an example. To the scholars, I'm a scholar. To theologians, I'm a theologian. To philosophers, I'm a philosopher. To geeks, I'm a geek. To sci-fi fantasy comic enthusiasts, I'm a sci-fi fantasy comic enthusiast. To artists, I'm an artist. To musicians, I'm a musician. To tabletop gamers, I'm a tabletop gamer. To Cowboys fans, I'm a commiserating Cowboys fan. To Anglos, I'm an Anglo. To Hispanics, I'm a Hispanic. To immigrants, I'm an immigrant. To cross-cultural sojourners, I am a cross-cultural sojourner. I am actively and intentionally trying to leverage everything I have to reach people for Christ. If we all do the same, there's not a person in Plano we can't reach. We each bring so much that is unique to us to the table, and we need to use it all. How can we be sure we're doing what God wants us to do? Let me share you an example, share with you an example from King David's life. First Chronicles 14, 9 through 17. 
Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of God, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And Yahweh said to him, Go up, and I will give them into your hand. And he went up to Baal Perazim, and David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a bursting flood. Therefore the name of that place was called Baal Perazim. And they left their gods there, and David gave command, and they were burned. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. And when David again inquired of God, God said to him, You shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and Yahweh brought the fear of him upon all nations. Two times David was faced with a challenge as he was leading Israel. The Philistines came against them in battle, and they made a raid in the valley of Rephaim. And it was his task to defend Israel. So David prayed and asked God what to do. And God told him, go fight them head on. He did and they succeeded. They defeated them. Not too long after that, the Philistines attacked again. Same army, same place. Most leaders would just go with what worked last time. Same challenge, same location, same solution, right? God already told me once. He doesn't need to tell me again. That's not what David did. Before he did anything, once more he asked God, what do I do? This time God gave him different instructions. Don't don't attack them head on. You need to circle around. You need to wait until I blow some wind on some treetops, and that'll be your signal. You think David would have ever figured that out if he hadn't asked? God gave him different instructions. He did as he was instructed, and they won the victory. I believe this is how we should do ministry. We don't need to ask, I'm I'm sorry, we need to ask God every step of the way to tell us what to do. We don't need to make grand plans for the next 20 years and ask God to bless them, and we'll check back with you in 20 years when we're making a new 20-year plan. We don't need to look back on what worked in the past and attempt to replicate it. We need to obey what he tells us this week. And then go next week and ask again and do next week what he tells us to do next week. Remember that after giving the Great Commission, Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until God empowered them for the task. God's plan was Pentecost. You think any of those disciples would have planned that? How exactly do you plan Pentecost? God didn't need them to plan. He needed them to listen and be available. And Pentecost is what he did. This is why this year we've begun kingdom prayer. If you're accustomed to prayer meetings in churches, you might think of this as, you know, we come and we find out who, how many sick people we know and we pray for them all. We do that already in the life of our church. That's not what we're doing on Mondays. In kingdom prayer, we are simply asking God, what are you up to and what do you want of us? What are you doing and what do you need us to do? We're not telling him. We're asking That's the purpose of our kingdom prayer. I'm going to confess I've been disappointed that so few of you have made time for this in your lives. I would love to see the whole church here on Monday evenings pleading with God to please tell us what he wants. What is your will? How can we join what you are doing? I know you've got your life going on. You've got things planned and going on, and you have events and things you've committed to. Let me tell you this. Change them. Rearrange. 
If you have to quit a commitment, quit it. Jesus said, if we seek first his kingdom, he'll take care of all the other stuff. If that's the night you get extra hours overtime, make time for this and trust that God knows what you need and will give it to you. But you can't fit the kingdom of God into the leftover corners of your life and expect great things to happen. Seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness. And then everything is given to us. I want us to have to change rooms. I want us to have to break up into a million tables of prayer. But if we really want to see God doing things, we need to ask Him what He's doing and commit ourselves up front. Whatever it is you need from me, I will do it. I'm, I want to do what you're doing, God. Show me, tell me, guide me. I want to ask you to be here Monday at 6 as we ask God to tell us what He wants And then I want you to be here again next Monday at 6. And we'll ask God again what he wants that week. And the following Monday, I want you to come back again so that we can ask for that week. If we seek God, he will guide us. I think one key indicator of God's will is where we can see him moving right now. Let me suggest a few areas where I see God moving in our church right now. I think he's given us a congregation with the right heart. For 11 years I've been here. And the thing I have heard from people over and over and over again the whole time I've been here is that when they walked into this church, they were received like they were at home. That the people came up to them and made them feel so welcome that it felt like home. That is something God has done in our heart as a congregation. We need to lean into that. And if you're one of the sour few, learn from your brothers and sisters. And let's make it even better. We are a church that has servant deacons. I've been in church my whole life. I've never seen a church with deacons like this church. In many churches, deacons are not helpful to the church. In many churches, deacons see the deaconate not as a commitment to serve, but as a position of privilege and power. And they have no calling to ministry, but they certainly like to hobble and stop other spiritual leaders in the life of the congregation at every point. I've witnessed that many times. This church has never been that way. Our deacons serve, and they do so many things most of you know nothing about. Some of you are the recipients of this service. You know all too well that they come out and mow your lawn if you can't do it, or they fix something that's broken in your home. Most people have no idea all the work tirelessly that is going on week after week by our deacons because they are serving the life of this church. Here in our uh, business meeting coming up in October, we're going to be voting to open up the avenue for twice as many people who might be able to serve us as deacons. And I'm excited about that. Let's ask God to continue raising up from within us a group of genuine Christ-like servants who can model for the rest of us what Jesus said was the most important thing in his kingdom. If you want to be the most important one in the kingdom of God, become the slave of everyone. This is something we have, and we need to lean into it. And uh, be ready, because in November, we will be asking people to commit to serve as deacons. If you are one of those, uh, be ready to serve. World Garden has been an amazing thing. It's uh, been uh, something that started uh, kind of uh, small and has slowly grown, as gardens tend to do, and uh, kind of engulfed the whole side of the building here. Um, 
But this has allowed us to connect with so many neighbors who walk by and we've met people from other nations and uh, the people who are working in the garden have said, are there any plants that you can't find, any fruits or, or, or vegetables that you can't find at the store from your home country? Give, them the, give us the seeds, we'll plant them so that we can offer them to you. And through this, uh, there has been a loving service to our neighborhood and we are known by our neighbors because of the love that we're showing through the World Garden. And you've seen so many Sundays where food has been given and every, oh, so many Wednesdays where we've given out food to people that's been grown right here on our own church grounds. Last year, last fall, we were able to have a, a gardening club with Weatherford Elementary kids who came over and we got to share with them. Weatherford Elementary is another area God's moving in. I've been here 11 years we've never had the connection with that school that we have now. This past year and a half has been incredible. The, the, the principal there is so uh, desperate for help and has been so eager. They, they asked us if we could be their shelter in place location and we agreed. They came over, looked it over and we are their official shelter in place. If there's a tornado or some big thing and they need to leave their building, this is where they come. And uh, we have asked the principal and the teachers, how can we help you? And they said, help us register parents. And that's what we did at the beginning of the school year. This, we spent a week inviting parents to come in and we were helping register them and their kids for school. We've had teachers of uh, special ed children who you know are overwhelmed in Plano right now. And they reached out and said, could y'all help us with some snacks? And we've been giving them snacks and they, we delivered them over there. And, and one of the teachers was saying, thank you so much. Normally we, we have to do this out of our own pocket. And every time we have told them, we're doing this for the community, we're doing that, they have actually asked us, give us flyers, we'll give them to the parents. How many schools in town are doing that? with churches and this is an open door God has opened and we need to make the most of it connected to that is our ESL uh, the school has actually been encouraging parents uh, who need to learn English to come to our ESL classes and they're coming and they're bringing their children and our ESL program is not like many we don't just teach English we also talk about Jesus very intentionally in fact, we're even serving the broader church. Uh, one of the things I've heard over the past few weeks, one of the students that came to one of our more advanced classes, uh, the teacher's asking, uh, why are you in this class? What are you trying to learn? And the student said, I'm trying to learn English so that I can share the gospel with more people. Where are these kinds of things happening? God is working in our church and drawing people to himself. And the people who are coming to ESL, this connection with Weatherford and the parents, they're bringing their children and youth here on Wednesday nights. And we're sharing the Bible with them. And we're loving them. And we're talking to them about Jesus and showing them what it means to be in Christ. And this is a huge need in our church. Those among us who've been working for children, some of them have been working for decades. And our numbers are dwindling in terms of the teaching group. Uh, we need more people who want to step in and love children and share Christ with them. And if that's your gift, if having a child around you makes you smile, come help. We need you. These kids need you. The work of the kingdom is happening. Join. Spanish language. I've already talked a little bit about how being able to do the service in Spanish has allowed us to reach a whole group of people we were not reaching. And I'm preaching the gospel to unbelievers Sunday after Sunday. That's a wonderful opportunity. And... Let me tell you what you non-Hispanics can do here. 
We're working hard to bring these people into the broader life of our church. I want those who know Spanish among us to step in right away and help communicate and encourage these people. But one of the most powerful things we have to offer uh, is for those of us who do not speak Spanish, those of us who are as Anglo as you could possibly be, when we reach out in love to an immigrant who is struggling to understand a whole new culture, someone they know has very little to offer in return, we are showing them the love of Christ. The, that kind of inexplicable grace says more about the gospel than any sermon I can preach. As you're doing all of this, teaching ESL, loving the people in front of you, struggling to communicate, patiently allow them, allowing them to practice their broken English with you, maybe even trying out your own broken Spanish on them, you are doing the work of the kingdom of God. Come down from Sunday school eager to find somebody who doesn't understand what you're saying and love them. Maybe even learn to greet someone with a kiss or maybe teach someone to greet with a hug. Can your Wanda language? Pastor O'Meara has been working tirelessly for years now, reaching out, uh, and he has full-time work. I mean, he's a very, very busy person, but he has been working hard to reach out to immigrants from Rwanda and Congo and has continued to draw people to the life of this church. And language is a, is a barrier, but many of them do speak enough English for us to communicate. Our fifth Sundays are a great opportunity for us to break bread together, worship together, build connections across culture, race, and language divides. Be praying with us about how we can deepen those ties. And who knows what might be next? As we join God in what he's already doing, let's keep our heart, hearts and eyes open to see where he is moving next. What new areas is he going to open up for us? Who will he bring to us that will enable our church to break into new groups of people? There are many lost Hindu people around us, and I don't see many churches at all making any significant inroads into that lost community. And the language isn't even a barrier there. How might God open doors for us in that community? There are people in the Korean community. Uh, are there uh, Koreans around us who would join in what we've done? We've had people in the past. Right now we don't. Are there ways we can find new points of connection? There's only one way to know. Join us in prayer. And let's ask God what he's doing and keep our eyes open and jump right in. <clears throat> you know the most, the least satisfying way to do the Christian walk is to just sit at home doing nothing, come here and sit on your pew doing nothing, and go back home and sit around doing nothing. That is an absolute tragedy because eternal work is happening. Step into it. Join it. And maybe you're one of those who God is going to put something on your heart and you're going to start pushing us in a new direction. You're going to open something new up. Listen to God and help us. God's calling us to join Him. God is working. And yes, the past year and a half, two years have been hard. But God is so good. And he's doing so much good. If we will just stop navel gazing and looking at ourselves and our own problems and start looking to the need around us, we will see that God is at work. And we can join him. Please join me in doing this. 
and let's stop playing at church and let's be church. Let's see the kingdom of God built right here in all of its glory. The full breadth and depth of it. Let's not settle for anything less than that. Let's not hold back. We've got this life to spend for Christ. Don't waste it on anything less than His kingdom. Please join me in prayer. God, thank you that you have loved us with an eternal love. That you have called us to yourself and drawn our lives together here in this city, in this moment, right now. You have put us together to do the kingdom work that you want to see happen right here. God, I pray that you give us hearts that are absolutely surrendered to whatever it is you are up to. Let us have no agenda, no goal, no vision, no dream, no passion, but you. Christ, be everything to us. Be our all in all. And let us be participants in this glorious work you're doing of drawing everything back into you. Give us the heart of reconcilers. Give us the heart of servants. And Lord, you have been so generous. You have given us so much. Help us be equally generous from the abundance you have laid in our laps as we reach out to the lost around us. May we hold nothing back. God, help us put you front and center. Put your kingdom in front of everything. Rearrange our whole lives if we have to so that you are front and center in everything. God, help us as a church to heed the call to prayer together. Convict us. Draw us to your feet and make us desperate to hear your voice and to see you moving and acting among us. Jesus, thank you that you have loved the world so much and that you call us to something so beautiful and so breathtaking and so spectacular. And we can be a part of it if we'll just turn to you and join you. Take us by the hand, God. Lead us where you are going and help us to be there together with the full diversity of what we are help us to be absolutely unified in you we love you Jesus We lay our lives in your hands. We place ourselves before you and commit ourselves to the work of your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.